And thanks all for joining. Um, great to see so many of you here. And also thank you for your questions. Hope we can get to uh, as many of those as possible. Um, so um, the way I thought I'd um, do the, the workshop today is just tell you a bit about my experience um, and how I got into climate journalism and um, what we do here at Climate Home News, um, which is one of the uh, places I work and um, we're hosting this event um, with Jenna Resources. And then I'll um, talk about what climate journalism is um, and um, what we do day to day at Climate Home. And then, of course, give some examples of the different types of stories that we cover, just to give you a sense of the range of our coverage. Um, and after that, I really um, would love to just do a Q&A and answer all those questions that you sent in and um, also take any new questions um, that pop up uh, throughout the session. So um, in terms of my experience, I, um, I didn't actually study science. I did classics at university and um, I did a lot of student journalism. That's really when I realized I um, wanted to be a journalist just from doing reporting for my student newspaper. After that, I did work experience and then I did um, a one year master's in newspaper journalism in London. And my first job was actually as a breaking news reporter. So very general, um, not I didn't I don't think I, I did a single climate story, but it was in my second job that my editor, who was really passionate about climate um, at Thomson Reuters Foundation, uh, which is part of Reuters. Um, she really encouraged me to explore this beat um, and do some writing around it. And I've really been covering climate ever since for a mix of quite mainstream uh, big news outlets, as well as um, smaller independent outlets, such as uh, Climate Home News. Um, so Climate Home News is um, a small uh, independent news outlet, and we focus on international climate diplomacy and politics, and we have a really global outlook. And what I do now is I, I freelance for them uh, two days a week. And then I also freelance for BBC Future, where I do more um, features, longer form writing. So um, I can talk a bit about the different types of um, climate journalism that I do. So in terms of um, what is climate journalism, if we could just go to the next slide. Um, of course, it is the biggest story of our time. It is the biggest challenge that governments, um, businesses and individuals face. Um, and it's such a, such a crucial time to report on it. And there are constant developments happening, um, which makes it a really exciting beat to be part of. It's um, very, very global. I actually can't think of a more global beat than climate. Um, it's really affecting people all around the world. And so as a climate journalist, I um, spend my time speaking to people, you know, in countries all around the world um, about the impacts they're facing, about the work they're doing to tackle the issue, about the politics in their country. Um, it's really varied. This is something that I think for a long time, climate was uh, placed in a bit of its own silo, and it was very much seen as um, a separate topic to um, you know, more mainstream news, but now what we're seeing is um, more and more coverage connecting it to all those beats that we care about, whether it's health or politics or business. Um, I've even done um, some stories focusing more on kind of culture and lifestyle um, linked to climate change. So it's really, really varied. And um, finally, it's very forward looking because of course it's a mix of reporting on what's happening now, um, which is really important to focus on the kind of real time impacts that we're witnessing, but also looking at um, into the future, what's projected, what are scientists saying, what are, um, and how, how can we avert some of those consequences that they are warning us about. In terms of day to day, um, so what, what happens at Climate Home is that we have, um, we start our day with a news meeting where the editorial team um, all uh, get together on Zoom and we discuss the stories of the day. Um, and this is um, a real mix. Everyone's working on their own independent reporting. Um, and this could be, you know, news of the day. So maybe there's an event coming up that someone's covering. Maybe there's a summit happening. 
maybe there's an announcement expected. Um, so we would cover that as news, but we are also doing longer term uh, features and investigations. And I'll give some examples of that. Um, so we, we talk through who's doing what, and we also uh, discuss our newsletter. So we have a daily newsletter um, that goes out at 12, and this gives um, like an exclusive kind of insights into um, the, the climate world. So we'll usually focus on one topic. Um, so last week we had a very busy news week because we had the IPCC uh, climate report, which was out. So we were explaining that to our readers, why that's relevant. And then of course, um, the Ukraine war, and we also uh, reported on that from a climate perspective, um, especially if you think about uh, an important angle is Europe's reliance on Russia for gas and all these big announcements um, coming from Germany about moving away from that. So we will divide up tasks and then everyone will, um, after the meeting, uh, go off and do their own reporting. Um, so I usually spend my day doing a mix of interviews and writing. But I also do some editing and commissioning because I um, commission freelancers around the world um, who report on climate justice. Um, so I spend time, you know, maybe speaking to them on the phone, um, finding out what their reporting plan is, or they'll be sending me their copy and I'll be editing it. And in terms of the um, examples I wanted to share, I thought it'd be good to give a sense of the different, um, different types of stories. So I want to share a news story, a feature, and an investigation. Um, so the first one um, on the next slide, um, I hope you can see, but it's, the, it's an article from May last year, um, which was when um, it, was, it was a really big court case involving Shell. Um, a judge in the Netherlands ordered Shell to cut its emissions by 45% by 2030. And um, the reason this got loads of coverage was, well, firstly, because it's Shell, you know, one of the major, major oil um, companies in the world. But it was also the first time a company has been held um, legally liable for its contribution to climate change. So to cover this story, it involved uh, tuning into the verdict and the press conference and getting reaction and commentary from that. And also speaking to campaigners about the impact um, of this ruling on Shell and its production. So what does it mean going forward? Uh, as well as this, there was it involved getting some analysis around the legal kind of context of the story. But, um, so I spoke to uh, lawyers and academics about how this one ruling could actually set a really important precedent for future lawsuits um, around the world. So that's just one example of, you know, it's a news story, so it's concise and we cover it on the day, but we try to get as much um, commentary and anal analysis to, to add a bit extra to, to that um, kind of big announcement. Then the second story is a feature um, so this is part of our climate justice reporting program, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and for this, it was all about um, India's palm oil push um, and what this means for local communities. So for a few, uh, feature, there's a lot more scope to do in-depth reporting. Um, you know, we'll spend uh, several weeks on this and it really involves um, getting a wide range of voices in there. And this story stems from the fact that there was a big um, government announcement made over the summer where the government said they plan to expand palm oil production in, the, in northern India. And we, um, we wanted to get a better understanding of what this actually means in reality. So what we did is we commissioned an Indian journalist um, through, through this program. And uh, she went off and she visited a community in one of the regions, um, spoke to people and really um, tried to, you know, get, get their voices um, heard and, and um, write a report on that. And 
the conclusion was that apart from the kind of uh, environmental concerns around deforestation, there were also a lot of concerns for women's rights um, because often the women end up doing the really hard labor. Um, they earn very little money. Uh, they don't have access to land. So it was really about kind of bringing that all together in, um, in quite a long story with, with photos taken by her. Um, and that's just one example of um, a feature where we, yeah, we do more of a deep dive into a topic. And then the final example is um, this one. So this is an investigation um, which I uh, worked on last year. Um, for an investigation, we usually spend several weeks, um, if not longer, looking into the topic. Again, it's more of a deep dive. Um, it's not necessarily linked to the news cycle. It can be. Um, in this case, I was looking into the Mauritius oil spill, which happened uh, six months before. And at the time, just like all these events, you know, it got a lot of coverage for about a week, um, maybe two, um, because of the really shocking images. And then it, the media coverage just died down. So um, we wanted to look into, well, six months on, what's happened? Um, has there been an investigation? Um, what's the investigation revealed? What are the longer term impacts of the spill on the community, but also on the environment? And also this, this major event happened and what, what does that mean for, for the shipping industry using this fuel? So lots of big questions and really involved um, me speaking to um, a lot of different experts, um, ranging from kind of shipping experts to oil experts, and also connecting with people in Mauritius, because of course I'm not there, I, I, can't, I don't know the full story, but they could really give me a sense of what was happening on the ground. And it turns out that, you know, there are still, um, there were lots of safety concerns about the fuel used on the ship. And it, this had kind of been, been covered up a bit and um, how it interacts with the water. And um, it, there had not been a lot of transparency about what happened. So it actually, um, you know, the piece includes kind of a warning about um, what this means um, and that if, if lessons aren't learned from, from this one disaster, there could be more disasters in future. Um, so we do, we do these investigations, um, you know, we, we all work on our own and whenever we have the capacity, we try, try and work on something kind of in the background to, to our news reporting. And with an investigation, you often, like I said, you kind of start with big questions and then you explore various angles. Um, because it's longer, you have the scope to do that and speak to um, a wide range of people. Uh, so it's it's a great it's a great opportunity to um, yeah do do that deep dive, um, and I guess I, I I hope this just gives a sense of that you know there's not there's not one type of climate story and and we really um, cover yeah stories from all around the world um, in different formats um, about yeah quite a wide range of topics. So um, I'm very happy to. Um, you know, take any questions at this point, or perhaps um, I, I put our contact details here. So we've got our website, our social media accounts, um, also my email address. So if there are questions after after the call, um, feel free to email me um, or reach out to us on Twitter, or on Facebook, or on LinkedIn. Awesome, right. Well, I will make sure I send these slides around to everyone. So I'll pause this now so that I can uh, I'm going to stop my screen share uh, in two seconds. Uh, there we go. Um, and we can go to some of your questions because what we really wanted from uh, this session is with the amazing speakers we have um, is to give you the chance to really kind of ask what you want to know. So I've got some up in advance. So I will perhaps put um, 
one or two to you now, Isabel, and then perhaps um, everyone else who is here live. Um, there are about 20 people here, so I'm not taking uh, no for an answer. So there must be someone here who wants to put their question uh, forward themselves. So I'll put a few to you. And in the meantime, if you want to either raise your hand, we can come to you directly. Or if you want to pop the question in the chat, um, I can kind of shout you out and you can ask, ask that directly. Um, so um, just looking at the list of ones uh, we had in, in advance, um, quite an interesting question we had in advance um, was around how to make climate um, pictures kind of palatable to editors without making them clickbaity. Obviously, you are very lucky in that you work for um, a very responsible publication that does some really great work. And we saw some of the examples there. But um, I was just looking in the chat, some of the people we've got are across a wide range of places from regionals to freelancers to all sorts. So whether you had any kind of tips on how to engage editors without it being that kind of clickbait um, way of doing it, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it's a really good question. Um, I think with climate stories, there is, um, you know, sometimes there are just really um, alarming like statistics and, and um, they kind of, it will just, that will be the focus and um, won't, really, won't really go beyond that. Um, I guess when I get, so I, I work with freelancers and when they pitch to me, um, the two questions I always ask them is, what's the new development um, to this story? So what, what's happening? Because often they'll pitch me, you know, kind of an ongoing issue um, and that, that's fine, but what's the new development and why are we reporting on it now? Um, and why is it relevant to an international audience? That's um, one thing that's really important for both the publications I work for. Um, you know, we, we have readers from all around the world. So if it's a local issue, that's um, that's completely fine. But what, why is that relevant to an international audience? Um, one example we saw last year was uh, there was all this um, uproar about the Cumbria coal mine in the UK which I think the government would have thought was a very local story, which wouldn't get a lot of media attention. But because they were hosting COP, um, it just it just completely exploded. And they got, you know, it was covered in the US. It was um, referenced um, by, by officials. And I think that's just an example of if you can find the international angle, um, that's, that's um, really, really important to highlight. Um, a few other things is, is there a solutions angle? That's something um, I think editors are really looking for. At the BBC um, is actually a requirement for the climate stories I pitch for them, that there is some kind of solution we can report on. Um, to they, they find that that's what really engages readers and it's just important to cut through all the kind of doom and gloom that we're seeing um, otherwise. And um, finally, I'd say like having some case studies and some characters, if it's a feature, really um, highlighting who, who they are and what their narrative is and how that will kind of shape your story is, um, is, is pretty important. Awesome, right, we've got our first question in the chat. Um, so I don't know, Federica, do you wanna ask that one yourself? Let me see if I can unmute you and then you might be able to, um, there we go. Hi, yeah, thank you. Uh, so, uh, well, yeah, I'm a very much of a start uh, to start a leveling broker reporting in Inverness, and I'd really like to get into climate reporting in, in our area. So I'd really like to ask if there's any tips to get started, especially if you're maybe starting from scratch and our media outlet is not doing climate reporting on a, a regular basis. So how to maybe get started and uh, where to look and... Uh, or what would be maybe best sources, how to uh, verify sources as well, and uh, maybe fact checking as well for where, where you have local companies or companies that are global, but that apps locally, how do you go on about um, verifying them? Sorry, again, that's eight questions in one. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's, it's a really good question. Um, and I guess, I, I would say if, if you're starting out, uh, covering a local story is, is a great way to start because you will have that on the ground insights. Um, you can add color because maybe you can visit the, the location. You can speak to people locally instead of, you know, having a Zoom call. Um, so I think, I think local stories are definitely the way to go. 
um, if you're starting. In terms of, um, you know, finding sources, this is always, you know, a challenge at the start every time you build like a network, but um, using Twitter is being, um, I, the climate community is super active on Twitter and you will just find pretty much, you know, anyone you need, whether it's a campaigner or an academic, an analyst. Um, so kind of getting used to using things like TweetDeck, um, searching, um, having lists of over time, yeah, that's something I use a lot, lists of sources and, and people I follow um, who commentate on climate. Um, and then, you know, once, once you've connected with a few, hopefully they can help you find other relevant uh, people to speak to, um, especially if it's campaigners that are very, they're very active on social media and they often have huge networks. So one thing I found is I've spoken a lot to youth, gen, um, youth activists over, over the years and I honestly like going through you know a few of the the ones I, I know I've been able to connect with people all around the world because they have such an impressive network um so that's really helpful and um challenging verifying what companies do this this can be tricky um I would always say in your reporting it's I always try and find you know an independent expert um who can you can put some of the claims or some of your findings to, and you can talk talk it through with them. Uh, that's really helpful. Also important for your reporting, just to have someone who's not a campaigner, who's not, um, you know, some, someone who's very close to, to, to the initiative, who can give you a bit of that independent uh, commentary. And, um, you know, I guess just put, putting it to the companies themselves, uh, sometimes, when they realize the story is going to be published anyway they actually end up wanting to say something or providing you with a bit more information um to to give some greater transparency that's great thank you awesome and we had you i want to jump back a second because in one of your answers a second thing awesome. you kind of mentioned solutions journalism a little bit as mm -hmm. well and i know that we had a question about that in beforehand um yeah. just around have you ever combined climate journalism with a solutions approach? I'm guessing the answer is yes. So I wonder if you could just perhaps a little, explain a little bit about what that approach is for anyone here who's not familiar with it and if you had any tips for kind of how to go about that. Yeah, definitely. Um, it, it's something that's really uh, growing. And again, it's because I think news organisations realise they need to cut through the noise. Readers don't want to just be confronted with overwhelming um, negativity, understandably. And it's, I think it really adds to people's sense of um, individual empowerment around climate action, if you, if you provide them with some solutions. So um, definitely a BBC future, it's a big focus. And it doesn't mean not covering, you know, kind of sugarcoating it and not covering the scale of the challenge. Usually what ends up happening is, you know, I'll think of a theme or, an issue that interests me um, quite often it's a problem and then I will try and find people who are working to, to tackle that problem um, and this is often on a quite a small scale you know we're talking about like community initiatives um, and once I have those that can form um, a really good starting case study for for my story um, so when it when it when we talk about solutions journalism it's not it's not about this is like a quick fix it's kind of focusing on here are some um, initiatives that you know are making a difference even if it's on quite a small scale in a local community sometimes it's on a bigger scale and if they're scaled up they could actually um, make a big difference um, so for that you speak to experts who can, um, so you, you tell them about what you found and they can place it into context and tell you more about that. Um, and one other thing we do at BBC Future is we run a series called Sustainability on a Shoestring, which is all about um, individual um, sustainability um, initiatives um, where we ask our writers to take on a challenge. Um, so this can be things like one of our writers um, just moved to a green pension Another one um, is, uh, you know, reducing the emissions from her diet. So they basically have a go at doing this and then um, speak to experts along the way. And it, it's all, it, again, it's all about kind of individual empowerment um, to, 
tackle climate change. Awesome, right. I think we're gonna to go to uh, Charlotte next. Did ask a question in advance, but it's here. So I'm gonna let you ask it yourself. Hi. Um, yeah, I was just wondering where you thought the kind of future of climate reporting was going. You were mentioning like um, it being more solutions focused. Did you have any other kind of themes or like ideas of where it's kind of heading? Good question. Um, well, firstly, it's definitely becoming more mainstream. Um, I said this earlier, but, you know, it used to very much be like a separate topic and um, now you can see like the BBC and Sky, they all have their own climate uh, verticals and programs um, dedicated to it. And it's also just infiltrating more of the, the other beats that we cover. So I think you're going to see that more and more, just um, something not necessarily being a standalone climate story, but being about um, we're doing lots of, you know, how, how is climate change going to impact elections? Um, and um, we, we did that when uh, Joe Biden became president because it was a really big deal um, from a climate perspective after Donald Trump. Um, but you're seeing it, you know, for all big elections, it's, it's um, featuring. So I think, um, yeah, finding ways to kind of break that down a bit. And, and um, if you're pitching as well, not necessarily thinking, yeah, thinking about if you're pitching to kind of big mainstream outlets, how you can present it as, as a story that's that's not just climate. It's also um, so many other topics combined. Um, that's, that's definitely something. Uh, yeah, the solutions, um, trying to think about, um, yeah, pro probably different formats as well. There's lots of climate podcasts. Um, there's, uh, the, there's, uh, Sky's got the climate climate daily show. They're very active on Instagram, Instagram lives. So I think again, it's just about being, you know, we we're now able to bring together so many different people as well. Um, at Climate Home News, we do Twitter Spaces. Um, so when we've when we've reported on a story, we'll get all the all those sources we work with on a daily basis to come on and and speak to you know, a wide audience about why this is relevant and and really explain it. So I think you're going to see a lot more of that kind of, um, yeah, broadening it out and, um, yeah, and, and explaining why, why this is more than just, you know, um, only of interest to scientists or policymakers. Awesome. Seeing as you've mentioned science, um, we had a couple of, um, and I know you mentioned that you don't necessarily need a science background to get into this. We did mm. have a couple of questions, um, just scrolling back, around kind of how to actually make these stories accessible um, to the general public. So do you have any general tips around um, breaking that science down to make it a bit more accessible and just understandable um, and something that they want to read? Yeah, I, th I think that's... Um especially because you'll be speaking to people you know experts who are really deep into into their research and the topics they cover and it's it's important to just ask you know the the kind of big general questions about what why is this you know how why is this relevant to your average person um how's this going to affect their lives so you know feel, firstly feeling able to to ask those questions which um when you're speaking to an expert might might seem a bit seem a bit strange to start with that, but that's really important because that's what you're going to have to communicate in your article. Um, in terms of, yeah, breaking it down, it's, it's um, doing, yeah, doing explainers. I think that's really important. So taking a big topic like we, um, we've done it before, we did one on what is COP26, even though we write for, you know, um, an audience where many of them know a lot about, about climate change. It's important to explain, you know, what what this big event is, um, and also break down, you know, what's expected of it. What what are the key things to look out for? Just providing those kind of um, very concise, um, yeah, reports um, to to help them understand why why that event is is um, so significant, and hopefully. What it achieves is it will give people who already knew a lot about it a bit more insights um, and then people who it will kind of attract new people to the topic and um, help them understand it. 
Awesome. I'm going to take a few more from the ones that were asked in advance because there's yeah. a massive pile and then we will come back to the chat. So do keep popping, popping them in there. Um, another theme that came up quite a lot that people asked in advance, um, which you'll probably have seen in the questions already, um, but it was around how to look after your own mental health when reporting climate issues slash, you know, finding new angles on something that's quite bleak. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts around both managing that in terms of making sure that you're feeling okay as a reporter but also that you're not you know in terms of your output you've mentioned solutions journalism already so kind of balancing that in your output as well yeah I think that's a really good question because you know I've, I've been saying of course I do focus a lot on solutions and I think it's you know it's important um <laughs> for myself as well to 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 highlight that um but of course a lot of the news can be very depressing especially these um, big reports that we cover, which really look into the future, give these projections and present you with those really stark, um, shocking stats about how many people are affected by, um, by climate change. Actually, last week, I just did a story on how the, the latest uh, scientific report had a whole section on mental health linked to climate change. Um, because there is now a lot of evidence that it is affecting people's mental health in quite a serious way around the world. Um, but even within that report, and that was what I tried to bring out in my article, there are um, there were suggestions for measures that can help and um, ha um, and reduce some of those risks. So when I did my interviews with experts, I, I asked them that as well. Um, you know, what's some practical advice um, about things that can make a difference? Um, in terms of, sometimes I think it's just important to be able to switch off as well. So I have a rule that um, at the weekend, I try not to be on Twitter because it can be just relentless. Um, and, you know, I, I try to go outside, go for a walk every day um, to have to have a break. Um, and yeah, so they, those are kind of my own my own personal uh, things and then um like i said in reporting i i um partly because it's kind of asked of me by editors but also because i find it important i try to have that mix of of speaking to people who are um making you know quite big strides um to to tackle the problem um whether this is like an innovator or a campaigner or you know like the shell victory that was you know speaking to lawyers who who were involved with that um that that's great to highlight the wins as well as focus on um you know the the challenges that that remain and i absolutely agree on the going for a walk thing we were talking about this uh yeah. just before we joined this call about how we'd both just been for a walk um hannah you had a question in the chat do you want to ask your question yeah i was just wondering i know you sp you've spoken a little bit about um pictures um but i was wondering if you could like I know everyone is different and all publications are different, but I was wondering if you had any like specific pitch tips, like what not to include and what to include and like maybe a little bit like structurally and stuff like that. Mm. Yeah, so I think um, for pitching, uh, firstly, uh, keep it, you know, quite concise um, and, and include a good like headline or suggested headline in your pitch to about how you'd um, draw readers in. Then answer those big questions about why, what, what's new, especially if it's a feature, because I think with news, it's sometimes quite obvious, but with a feature, there's still a reason we should be covering it at this time. So what's new? Um, what's the new developments, um, which perhaps even if this story has been covered before, what are you adding to it? Um, how does it tie into the wider themes and issues that your publication cares about? So, like I said, uh, for Climate Home, um, there are things like, is it international? Is it um, focusing on perhaps, uh, we, we do a lot of reporting where we look at maybe some kind of underlying tension. So if, you know, a small community is up against a big company um, and th there's that tension, or perhaps there's a government that have promised something, but actually it's not happening because there are underlying, you know, economic reasons they don't want to make changes. So I kind of kind of spelling that out and saying there's, there's this tension and this piece is going to, you know, speak to people on both sides and explore that. 
Um, and looking at, you know, case studies, um, maybe picking, picking a, a real, I think what's really important is um, in climate, especially climate policy, which we cover a bit, you know, climate politics, there's a lot of like um, big summits and talk about stuff, but what's the real life um, impact and what, what's actually happening. So what we try and do quite a lot is to, to find, you know, a community or uh, someone working on one of the issues that might come up endlessly at these meetings, but what, you know, actually speak to someone on the ground. Um, and so for that, I would say, um, I always go to places like, um, you know, Care International, Greenpeace. They, they, they have so many people, they have offices all around the world. So what you can do is you can send them an email and say, I'm looking for, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm focusing on this wider, wider issue. I'm really interested to know if this is something you're working on and if there's someone like an expert or a campaigner in your network I could speak to and um, they're, they're really helpful and they can direct to you. Thank you. Awesome. So we have a question from John. Unfortunately, John is here, but has a new setup, which means there's no mic or camera. Uh, so I'm going to ask it um, on John's behalf. It's a very interesting question. Um, John says they're always trying to find out the cost of implementing a green project, but no one ever seems to know. Uh, the general response always is that the project is better than doing nothing. Um, do you think it's worth keeping looking for the answer um, to work out how much these projects do cost? Um, or is it a case of just focusing on the project outcomes? Yeah, I think it is really important. Um, you know, I think it's important to highlight that often there is maybe ambition or intent to make changes, but there are just barriers in the way, like costs. Um, that's you know that's the way the world works, and we um, that's important to recognise. And and even you know there's there's reasons companies might not be moving as quickly as um, as you know, campaigners would want them to. So it, I think it is really important to highlight. Um, but then again, focus on, you know, what what could make what could make that difference? What could um, bridge that gap? So uh, one example I'm thinking of is uh, we've done quite a bit of reporting on shipping, um, which is a really, really polluting industry. Like it needs to change. And it's um, the problem with shipping is once the ships are built, you know, they're they're there for 30 years. So if we don't make changes now, we're talking about, um, you know, very policing ships um, still being out there by 2050. But the major problem is that there is just the, the um, zero emissions fuels, which they're trying are just so much more expensive. So the reality is they don't get used. Um, so when I speak to people about this, a big question is always, well, what could, you know, firstly, what is the cost difference um, to, to kind of put it into perspective? And also what could um, what could help bridge that gap? And often it's, you know, kind of big things like regulation and, and policies. And um, but it's it's important to highlight and you can still report on the story and and, you know, highlight the need to change, but um, explain that it's very difficult to do so. Awesome. Um, so another question that we had, uh, I'm conscious I do want to make sure that we have time to answer this. We had a lot of questions um, around how not to uh, generalise around kind of a Eurocentric perspective uh, when reporting on climate mm. change and how to, you know, there will be cases where we are reporting on things and we're not physically there um, and how to do that to the best we can. So I know you mentioned um, in your investigation or feature earlier that you kind of hired in other reporters. So just any general tips, I guess, about framing, what things you should be doing, um, and just general press practice on that one. Yeah, um, so I think for features, especially if you're looking for, um, you know, community experiences um, and colour on the ground, you really need to try and see if you can collaborate with someone who's in the country um, who has that insight. It's, you know, there's no way that we're going to be able to um, replicate that. So we tried to do that as much as we can. And a BBC Future actually mainly um, work with freelancers as well. So they, they have a big network uh, for those stories. Um, I, otherwise, if you're doing, if you are reporting on it yourself from the UK, 
there are ways to do it, but it's it's really having that network of sources and speaking to people who can give you that um, kind of local context, local insights, um, which, you know, even if you've done a lot of research, it can be difficult to, to just find online. So I often um, will, well, I'm, I'm lucky to work with teams who are very well connected and um, I, I, I will often say I just don't have a source a starting point for this story and um, do you know someone and then we'll share we we always share kind of contact information of sources with each other and um, there's great networks on Facebook there's like the Vulture uh, Club where if you're looking for a journalist in a specific place or like a fixer you can you can put a request in um, and I think with sources just being aware that sometimes especially if you if you don't really know someone beforehand and you're reporting on maybe something a bit more sensitive or complex, um, having like an, just an introduction call. Um, I don't, um, if, for some stories, I just have like a background chat um, to, to understand. They, they can help me understand the situation, um, the kind of local issues. And then that's really helpful for when I do, um, you know, more formal um, official interviews um, so, so that's that's something, and um, I, I think it is really important to be aware that uh, we, we try to do this as much as we can. That we shouldn't have this Eurocentric approach to to our reporting, and um, to to really work, even if you're working on a story which might, you know, um, be happening at, at COP or like a, at a summit hosted somewhere in Europe to try and find um, commentators fr from outside the country or from outside the region who can um, give you more insights from their perspective. So we try to do that as, as much as possible. And um, yeah, it's, it, people are very, very like responsive and happy to chat usually. Awesome. Sorry. And just, just to stress, by the way, I keep looking this side because I'm, uh, this is where all my questions are. I didn't want you all to think I was just annoying. No, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else did we have um, in our list? Um, I think we had, um, one of the questions we had in, that I also thought was quite interesting, um, was around whether you take any steps to offset the climate footprint of your own journalism. So is, or is this just a consideration that you sometimes think about? Yeah, I think it's a really valid question and definitely important. I don't think we can just be jetting off um, and, you know, to report on the story. I mean, the pandemic's made it very difficult to travel, so it's been easy to keep my carbon footprint down. Um, and, and when I have travelled in the last uh, two years, it has been by train because um, when, as, um, as the Climate Home team went up to Glasgow, we got the train um, and I went to Wales recently to report on a story and, you know, I don't have a car, I easily got there um, by train and bus. So um, in Europe, it's it's um, very, very doable. And um, I think if if it's possible, um, should should be an important part of um, your travel, your uh, reporting plans. Um, BBC Future actually have um, at the bottom of all their stories, they, they note down the carbon emissions involved in producing that story. And that's quite a new thing they've started doing uh, just to be like transparent with, um, with uh, that audience about that. So again, um, you know, if, if you're an editor or you're working on a story which is far away, thinking about, well, perhaps there's a local journalist who could cover that story. Um, they'll probably know more about the, you know, the, the context and also um, it keeps the, the emissions down. Um, and, you know, I mean, the, I'm sure there will be, uh, we, the COP this year is in Egypt and we haven't made plans yet as a team, but of course there's, <laughs> there's only one way for us really to get there. Um, so, you know, but I think when it's possible, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's an important um, thing to consider and, and uh, yeah, to, and to be transparent about. I've also got another question, if that's okay. Yeah. I feel like this one's a bit left field, but um, I feel like when I was at uni, like the student journalism I was involved with didn't have like a particularly distinctive focus on like climate reporting. Like there was like the odd article here and there, but I feel like through the amount of like, like we were talking about how it's way more in the mainstream now, like there wasn't that same 
kind of thing. So I was wondering if you had any recommendations of sort of how we can bring climate reporting a bit more into student journalism, like what sort of topics to start with exploring, like whether that's within the university or yeah. Like I know you said about the um, sustainability series on a shoestring, I really like that, like that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah, I think that's really good. I mean, I was the same. I it really was not um, part of my journalism degree. I think my my course had just started a science journalism like um, program, but it was the first year, and um, I, I don't know if that features climate journalism, but it's not something um, the average journalist is kind of focusing on um, when when they're doing their training. Um, so in terms of I think again for finding maybe local stories um you can find uh, maybe an environmental issue in in your in your community and and there's you know there's always things like protest demonstrations you could go along to um to speak to people again finding like a local a branch of um a campaign group i know um i i'm in south london and i'm on the mailing list for the greenpeace um chapter and and they they have loads of meetings and i'm sure that you you'd find a lot of well first you'd find out what what they're working on um but you'd also find lots of um you'd meet lots of people who are working on this so i i think um doing things like that and and yeah i think lifestyle stories are really interesting to people because it's something a lot of us are trying and also you know what I always say to people writing for this um sustainability on a shoestring series is it's really important to be honest because sometimes it's just not that easy and or it's expensive um so we're it's all about again kind of highlighting the challenges along the way and and seeing why that's the case so um yeah, that's you, you could always yeah uh, kind of find someone who's who's doing something a bit quirky or or try something yourself and 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 write about that as well. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. As a fun fact, I think I was just trying to look it up. I think the board in Warwick, um, I'm a bit of a student paper nerd, are the first uh, student paper to have a climate change section specifically. So wow. that's a fun fact for you all. Um, Amazing. Uh, Flavia, did you want to ask your question yourself? We've had another one in the chat, um, if you wanted to put that to you, um, Isabel. Hi, um, yeah, so I'm actually a student journalist, so I'm in uh, last year of my degree and I kind of contribute a lot to our student radio station with some written stuff and some podcast stuff. And my question was sort of around building and maintaining like a network of experts and sources and whether you have any tips for that, because obviously like I'm at the very start so I'm kind of starting to build those connections and stuff and some go better than others if you know what I mean like some people you just sort of lose touch with or they respond really well to an initial request but then they won't respond so well when you get in touch a few months later for something else so yeah it's just kind of wondering how you build those relationships and kind of maintain them so that you can keep people coming to you as well as me coming to them with ideas and things that are happening yeah, um, great question. Definitely. Um, it's, I mean, first thing to say is just remember that you will automatically build up that network as you do reporting, and it's just not the case. You know, I'm still constantly building my own, and there are many topics within the climate beats where I don't have, you know, an established network. And there are other areas where I've reported on a topic, um, you know, many times. And I have, um, I've met people who are experts. I always also just, people, are, especially if they're academics, uh, scientists, um, analysts, and to be honest, anyone, I, I will just ask them, you know, can, can you recommend someone who knows within your network, who knows about this? And they're more than happy to share um because sometimes it's just you know you, you've kind of gone you've done your online research and you found someone on LinkedIn who's who sounds like the right person but you, they might not have the exact kind of knowledge of the topic you're looking into but they they probably will know someone who you can go to um so so that's the first thing and just keeping track of those sources you know kind of maybe having a contacts list um and and just have you know having that um ordered in sections so knowing these are the people i can go to for these topics that's i mean often when i'm pitching or i'm thinking of a story i'll think oh um 
the, these are kind of my experts on this area. So I'll, I'll try them first and I can kind of categorize it like that. Um, other things, um, what I was saying before about if you're looking to meet people more uh, locally, you could go to events, um, you could go to meetings of campaign groups, um, webinars. There's lots of like online events, and mailing lists you can sign up to where they just and, and then once you're on their mailing list, they will kind of keep you informed. So that that's a good way to do it because, um, you know, often they'll they'll host, you know, like five or six people and you'll get a sense of what their area, their expertise is and, and they'll share their contact details and then you can kind of follow up with them after. Awesome. We've got about five minutes left. I have an endless stream of questions from people <laughs> that are watching back, but this is your last chance if anyone is here in the call and has something that you've been sitting on um, for a little while. So this is your penultimate warning. Um, one of the ones that we uh, did have in advance, which I thought was interesting, um, was we've obviously talked a little bit about how to get into climate journalism. Whether you had any specific tips um, around kind of pivoting. So let's say you know, you're working in lifestyle journalism or entertainment or just straight news journalism um, about how to kind of make that switch or just integrate it into your reporting. Yeah, I think it's important to remember that it's actually quite unusual for journalists to maybe only have one beat their entire career. And um, I, I really learned this when I was um, in my second job, which is where I um, kind of fell into climate. But I, um, the, the head of this uh, Thomson Reuters Foundation was a super established journalist and she'd been, so the, they, the Thomson Reuters Foundation do kind of underreported humanitarian news, um, women's rights, climate, um, but before that, she'd been head of entertainment at Reuters and covering like showbiz, showbiz and going to premieres. And so it just shows, you know, she, she was a great writer and she had a great sense for a story. And those are all skills you can transfer um, on, onto other beats. So it, it definitely isn't the case that if you're in one kind of specific section, um, you can't write about climate. And even if you're not, you know, you don't want to necessarily be a climate journalist, you just want to do a bit more sustainability reporting, climate reporting, um, there are so many links to other sections. So I guess if you're doing lifestyle journalism, think about, you know, th those um, individual changes that people can make. Um, one thing that I'm really interested in is things like fast fashion and sustainability, because they're all coming out with these big campaigns. So looking into that a bit more um beauty is a is a massive one um in the same way if you're doing politics you know there's there's ways to the government's um, made all these massive commitments net zero pledges but what's actually happening in the meantime and looking into you know the um how that fits with things like their covid recovery plans and all of that it's um I, I feel I, I'm always trying to think of and actually when, when you're a climate journalist you're really kind of made to think of climate angles for everything and as a team we've been doing that a lot the last couple of weeks um with the Ukraine news um because obviously we're not going to cover that from kind of a, a main news perspective but it's we've there's a huge demand for it from our audience and we have to cover it so we have to find the climate angles to that story i'm going to be really cheeky and throw one more question in from the list because you mentioned fast fashion and we had a question in um around guarding about how do you guard against greenwashing and this is something i've read a little bit about um specifically recently in the context of um fashion so i don't know whether you had any just general tips to kind of close off around um just i guess yeah checking the what you're what you're being told is right and you're reporting the right facts yeah it's um it's a massive <laughs> massive thing because every company is has got sustainability um you know goals now it's it's um really really part of of their like the way they operate Right. Um, interestingly, I actually published a story today on greenwashing, um, which was about adverts that have been banned because of greenwashing. And we're going to be doing um, this for the BBC. We're doing a whole series on greenwashing, looking at 
you know, what, why, why are these companies so successful at convincing us to buy these products? And, you know, how, what kind of language are they using to do that? Um, it's, it's really tricky to know. So I think the, the important thing is to go to an expert and, and just fact check with them. Um, because, you know, it might, it, sometimes it's really difficult to draw that line and know if it actually is, um, you know, a real sustainability initiative or if they're misleading. So going, going to an expert who's independent, there, again, there is just so many people, um, you know, for a quick Google search, you'll find um, people working on this who've, uh, who've done studies on it. Um, there's reports on it and there's campaign groups working um, specifically on greenwashing within fast fashion. So dropping them a quick line and seeing if they can just, just verify what you're thinking and then give you some commentary. That's, that's something I try to do um, as much as possible because you will just be bombarded with, um, <laughs> with emails about um, all, the, all the best things they're doing. Amazing. And before we go, um, I know you mentioned it earlier, um, oh, uh, we will we will find the link for you, Federica, around the oh, BBC. I can post that in the chat. That would be amazing. We will send out. We've mentioned a lot of different things today, so we'll send all those resources to you. And um, I know you mentioned it earlier how to find kind of climate home news. Is there anything in particular that we you'd encourage people to do? Is it sign up for the newsletter, go and follow elsewhere? I um, just want to give you one last chance to to plug where people should be going if they want to see more. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So we have uh, we have two newsletters. We have a daily one, which really gives you that exclusive um, insight. And then we also have a weekly newsletter, which is a great um, introduction to um, we, we just do a roundup of the week. Um, so we tell you these were the big stories. Um, this is why it's relevant and there's a bit of commentary and then we also include the links to all our latest stories um, and the weekly one is free. So I'm um, great if you sign up and and it's it's a good introduction to what we do um, and appears in your inbox every Friday. Apart from that, I'd say uh, follow us on Twitter because that's where we're most active um, and we've got all our stories on there. Um, as well as we're hosting um, more and more, we're doing these Twitter spaces, which um, if you've never joined one, they're great because you can just, um, it's just audio, you just tune in. So if you're out for a walk, you can just listen in. And it's usually about 20 minutes to 30 minutes um, of one of our journalists kind of leading a discussion, asking experts com um, for, for their reaction to something um, that we've reported on. Um, so re really, um, often quite explainer focus so so taking a big topic and 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 um you know we did one for the ipcc report what's in it it's a massive report so what are the kind of key takeaways and why is that important um but we're also on instagram and facebook uh yeah julia's just sharing all the links here so um should give you a good sense of all the different type types of reporting we do